Hello and welcome back to West Country Rivers Trust Catchment Science webinar series. I'm Nick Paling and I'm Head of Evidence and Engagement at West Country Rivers Trust and over the last 10 years I've been heavily involved in many of the Trust's integrated catchment management, collaborative governance and strategic catchment evidence programmes. This is the third webinar in this mini-series of four episodes focusing on how we have used a five-stage proof-of-concept approach to support the delivery of Southwest Water's flagship environmental management programme, Upstream Thinking, over its first 10 years. In the first webinar of the series, I gave an overview of our five-stage approach to using data and evidence to inform the design, delivery and iterative improvement of adaptive catchment management initiatives. In this webinar, the third in the series, I will be explaining the critical third stage of our proof of concept process, which focuses on our proof of concept work examining the delivery of catchment management interventions and actions. This action research approach includes the monitoring and evaluation of scheme governance, the optimization of our advice and investment delivery mechanisms, and the evidence-led development of our integrated catchment management interventions toolbox. During my summary of this third stage of the process, I will give examples of the various studies we have undertaken and the outputs and case studies we have produced over the years. Perhaps most importantly, the presentation will include all the links you need if you would like to find out more information about any of this work. So back in 2009-2010, when the Upstream Thinking Initiative was first being uh, set up, um, West Country Rivers Trust uh, and other catchment management um, organisations were working at that time in a project called the Rural Land Use and Economics Project uh, with a number of academics um, and it was that time that um, inspiration was taken from the US EPA's Adaptive Watershed Management Cycle uh, which was originally a pencil sketch shown here um, that they developed in 2005 and we um, uh, borrowed, took inspiration from uh, that original pencil sketch um, and turned it into a uh, uh, collaborative framework for informed, integrated and, as I say, truly collaborative environmental planning and delivery. And the, uh, we spent a lot of time working on various projects um, to develop this uh, process, um, working uh, to uh, implement it at the right scale and with the right people involved. And this um, really set the foundation for the upstream thinking approach, which was, uh, is also, um, as you can see from the, our five stage process, um, a proof of concept for upstream thinking, uh, an adaptive catchment management uh, process cycle. And at that time in 2012, 2013, it was no surprise that this um, process, this concept, um, became the uh, core framework for the um, nascent catchment based approach which was uh, which was uh, launched in pilot phase in 2011-12 and then rolled out across the uh, catchments across England um, cross border Wales um, in 2013. Now interestingly um, this adaptive management cycle is also very very similar to uh, the newly emerged natural capital approach um, which is shown here uh, and the similarities between the two processes which are both um, adaptive iterative processes um, and have very similar stages in the process is is, for, is, is there for all to see um, and this is how we know that upstream thinking as we've delivered it is an adaptive capital management process but it's also fundamentally a natural capital approach uh, and if you're interested in some of these concepts and theories um, then I recommend that you have a look at um, a report that we've recently produced for DEFRA called the Local Action Project 3 report and that is focusing on collaborative natural capital approach um, uh, in catchment management in England. So upstream thinking, we've always had the idea that upstream thinking is a payments for ecosystem services scheme. Um, so very quickly here the definition of what a payments or a PES, um, PES scheme is is number one, it's a voluntary transaction where a well-defined ecosystem service or a land use likely to secure that service is bought, invested in, by a minimum of one ecosystem services buyer from a minimum of one um, ecosystem services seller, typically in our situation a farmer, uh, if and only if the ecosystem service provider secures ecosystem service provision. 
That's what's called conditionality. Um, and we spent a lot of time um, during the establishment of upstream thinking and other catchment management initiatives looking at payments for ecosystem services uh, concepts and theories. Um, and indeed, upstream thinking uh, became a case study in the DEFRA PES handbook um, back in 2013. So this graphic shows the, the key concept in payments for ecosystem services, whereby rather than just gaining private profits from uh, land management and agricultural production, um, the payments for ecosystem services scheme encourages uh, not only um, compensation of farmers for loss of profit as they uh, look to uh, add ecosystem service function to their land, um, but also potentially if those additional benefits are measurable, um, then there is this idea that they can secure payment based on the, provi on the provision of those other factors as well. Um, and so this is absolutely fundamental to our proof of concept approach because these additional benefits must be measurable. They must be demonstrated um, in order for a true payments for ecosystem services scheme to be brokered uh, and established. So I had, I had uh, you actually thinking of a payments for ecosystem services scheme in theory. Um, we've been working probably for 10 years now to try and uh, ensure that this is a true pay, uh, PES scheme. Uh, and back in uh, during the water project, early in upstream thinking's uh, fa first phase, um, we developed um, a PES guidance booklet under a project, an interreg European funded project called the Water Project. Um, and this is where this graphic and these information comes from. So that's definitely worth having a look at. So our work on, on payments for ecosystem services and indeed a natural capital approach have continued. Uh, to this day and we have spent a huge amount of time looking at the different uh, actors, the different roles um, that are required uh, for a payments for ecosystem services uh, scheme to be established, um, characterising who are the buyers, who are the investors, um, who is the regulator of the scheme, who is the regulator in the environment, um, who are the sellers and, and most importantly of all um, identifying this critical role of the broker who um, works as a facilitator, um, also as a knowledge provider, uh, as the point of integration, uh, and also um, to a certain degree um, regulates and, and maintains balance uh, between buyers and sellers in the scheme. So WRT uh, and the other upstream thinking partners have been working as brokers and knowledge providers in upstream thinking for 10 years now. Uh, and really uh, in proof of concept terms, we're really focusing in on um, this broker role uh, how does it work? Um, how do we know that it's being delivered correctly and successfully? Um, and and how does it really underpin the delivery of a payments for ecosystem services scheme? So over the last 10 years of upstream thinking, there's been a number of projects which have um, been aligned with upstream thinking, um, particularly focusing on governance of catchment management um, schemes, uh, the methodology, delivery mechanisms, uh, financial um, instruments and delivery mechanisms. And the, the, the first one, really, the, the biggest one was the water project, for which I, as I mentioned, uh, we developed the uh, PES guide, um, which you can still download and read. Um, in addition, at the same time, in 2011, we worked on a um, project called the DEFRA Strategic Evidence and Partnership Project, which we called the Three Rivers Project. Um, and this is very much looking at the establishment of strategic partnerships and the use of data and evidence to um, build collaborative catchment management schemes, um, particularly in that case between water companies and rivers trusts, but actually more broadly than that, it fed straight into the establishment of the catchment based approach. Um, and it really focused on ecosystem services mapping and on, on, on that broker role. Slightly later in upstream thinking, actually, as upstream thinking moved from the first phase into the second phase, we were partners in a Life Plus program, uh, environment program project uh, called Water Life, um, which was led by WWF. Um, we also partnered with the Rivers Trust in that project. Um, and again, the Water Life report for the Tamar, uh, the catchment on which it focused, uh, is available. And it really, um, and this was um, directly aligned with um, working out how catch management schemes like upstream thinking could um, support the delivery of water framework directive objectives uh, and catchment partnership um, 
and collaborative catchment management initiatives such as the catchment based approach. And bringing us right up to date, the most recent uh, project that's been aligned with upstream thinking is the Channel Payments for Ecosystem Services project or CPES, which is another interreg funded, uh, more share area funded um, project looking again at these new innovative financial instruments, payments for ecosystem services, natural capital approach, uh, and really trying to um, align some of these theoretical governance uh, studies um, and experiments with the Upstream Thinking Initiative. So all of these reports are available um, uh, through the website um, and I would recommend that you have a look at all of them because uh, they're all equally interesting and obviously relevant to Upstream Thinking. So, as we, uh, we're in the section of the, uh, the webinar relating to delivery, um, I thought I'd give a quick summary, a quick review of what Upstream Thinking has um, delivered uh, over the first 10 years. So this map shows the delivery areas of Upstream Thinking 1, um, and you can see the partners uh, there. And during Upstream Thinking 1, around £9 million worth of investment from South West Water were put in, to these um, target areas um, and indeed that nine million pounds was also added to um, by around the same amount uh, in, in co-finance uh, and complementary funding um, generated uh, by the partners uh, and that funding input led to um, over 700 farms being engaged in the priority areas shown. Um, Devon Wildlife Trust themselves um, restored over 100 hectares of com habitat, com grassland habitat uh, and the two Myers projects on Exmoor and Dartmoor uh, were responsible for the restoration of over 2,000 hectares of, of uh, peat upland uh, during that five-year programme as well. So as you can see, it was Corn Wildlife Trust focused then in the, in the first five years very much in West Penwith. Then Wildlife Trust focusing on the working wetlands, calm grassland areas. Uh, West Country Rivers Trust looking at a number of catchment, uh, catchment management schemes in drinking water catchments and the two national park authorities focusing on Myers restoration in their areas. In 2015, uh, we saw the initiation of Upstream Thinking 2 in AMP 6. Um, and what you can see is that there was a broadening of the, uh, the, the areas, the number of areas that were focused on, um, particularly focusing now on drinking water protected areas and the catchments upstream of drinking water abstractions. Uh, uh, and you can see there was a whole series of uh, catchment management schemes initiated. Some ex um, were existing areas in upstream thinking already, and many um, were added to that uh, list in upstream thinking too. In upstream thinking too, just over £10 million worth of investment from South West Water, um, around £8 million of complementary co finance secured by the partners during the five year project. And that investment led to um, around 860 integrated farm management plans being created um, and 766 farms brought under active, manage, under active management. Uh, and that led to a total area of 175,000 acres of farmland being brought under active management. Uh, and indeed the project also saw um, a total area of uh, habitat restored of 5,500 acres of, of habitats restored during the five year cycle as well. And so now um, in April 2020, I've uh, just seen the start, initiate, the initiation of uh, Upstream Thinking 3 in AMP 7. And as you can see from this map, um, a slight change in the partners involved in the project, um, but many of the catchments um, are continuing um, as, well as, uh, as what are called business as usual catchments, continuing to uh, deliver advice and support to the farming community in the catchments that we're working on in Upstream Thinking 2. And indeed, uh, a number of additional catchments have now been added either as investigations or, or uh, as new schemes in their own right. Okay, so now we're going to move on to look in, to look in more detail at the actual delivery of advice uh, and measures under Upstream Thinking um, that has been undertaken over the last uh, 10 years and moving forward into Upstream Thinking 3. Um, the Good Farm, Bad Farm graphic illustrates very well, very clearly, um, the, diff, the, the transition that we're trying to achieve in the rural landscape. And we have a very well-characterised toolbox of measures, which we call Best Farming Practices, 
which we've been delivering um, in catchments across the West Country uh, for many years now. Uh, and this uh, graphical device has been very useful in helping to illustrate to stakeholders what uh, we're trying to achieve in terms of creating more resilient, um, more sustainable uh, and um, healthier ecosystems in our rural landscape. So perhaps the critical stage of our delivery of upstream thinking is actually in the farmer engagement advice, advice and, and of course the investment. But it's this um, building rapport, uh, building social capital with the farming community that is at the absolute heart of our approach. Um, and you can see depicted here a whole series of uh, events, uh, farm walks, um, uh, tutorial masterclasses on th such things as soils um, and different farming techniques, use of pesticides. And this is really the day to day bread and butter of the upstream thinking farm advisor uh, out on the ground engaging with uh, the farming community. Uh, and actually we have a whole series of um, event reports and case studies relating to all of these different uh, events uh, and interactions and techniques that we use in terms of farmer engagement. What does it look like in terms of investment? Um, well, there's a whole raft of um, examples and case studies. Uh, we have a very great many uh, summaries of the investments um, that we've made showing before and after photographs. Uh, and this just these these graphics just show some of those um, transitions, some of those changes that have been implemented and the investments that have been made. And behind each one of these investments, of which there are many, um, then uh, there is a detailed uh, case story, a case study um, explaining exactly what the approach was, um, what the solution was and what the challenge uh, that was being answered. You can see it, there's a great number of these from across all the catchments. Um, some are very clear and in their effect um, and it's also very important to recognise that more often than not these, are, these interventions are delivered at a 50% grant rate um, and that therefore Southwest Water um, and, our, and the partners are investing um, half of the, 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 the value of the assets that have been created and invested in uh, and the farmer indeed funds the other half which is a very important um, aspect of, of upstream thinking's delivery mechanism. So we have a uh, we're de developing a whole raft of farm case studies showcasing specific examples of techniques that we've delivered um, during upstream thinking so far, and they can all be downloaded from the website. So another aspect of this is that um, over the over the course of upstream thinking, our farm advisors have become extre extremely knowledgeable um, and uh, developed significant expertise, particularly in a number of um, aspects particularly relating to soil um, and here you can see Jörg Watkins leading a, uh, a demonstration um, experiment looking at sediment mobilization in a field and indeed we've many of the upstream thinking partners have become involved in the development of some uh, wonderful resources such as the soils um, and natural flood management um, document that's recently produced in East Devon um, by the Environment Agency's um, leading soils expert Richard Smith um, in association with the catchment partnership there uh, and indeed that's actually led to um, another project being funded which is currently underway called the Devon and Cornwall Soils Alliance which is funded by the Water Environment Grant um, and this has um, really been triggered and facilitated by upstream thinking um, and the development of this soil expertise that um, in the project and amongst the advisors uh, working on the project. Um, so this is a really important move forward uh, as soils play a critical role um, as a vital natural capital asset in regulating ecosystem service provision in uh, the West Country's rural landscapes. Uh, and that, uh, the, perhaps one of the most important factors um, in upstream thinking too, and particularly in relation to soil health and soil um, organic carbon content is relating to pesticides. So there's been a major focus in upstream thinking too on reducing pesticide pollution in raw water sources um, and there's been a real focus in the delivery of upstream thinking too on giving advice and guidance to farmers, land managers, agronomists and spray contractors in relation to pesticides. Um, a whole series of training and investments that um, have been designed to reduce the risk of point source pesticide pollution um, and we've actually undertaken quite an extensive study of farmer behaviour 
um, and decision making and integrated pest management. Um, so truly really trying to understand um, the, the decision making processes that farmers go through as they um, attempt to combat um, pests, diseases, weeds um, in, in their, on their farmland. So there's a, this is the subject of another uh, webinar in this series, um, which is looking at the development of a pesticide simulator. Um, and I would recommend that you have a look at that if you're interested in the pesticide aspect of things. So fundamental to this process, which has been absolutely critical in upstream thinking too, is that there are three main mechanisms of pesticide pollution. Um, the first is uh, pesticides being washed off land following their uh, right and proper or, or and correct application to land, which is something that can always happen um, irrespective of whether that application has been done correctly or or incorrectly. Pesticides can also be lost to the water environment following spills during preparation of formulations uh, and equipment preparation, washing after after application. And finally, um, there is also a significant risk posed by uh, leaks of pesticides and active ingredients from either current or more likely old or obsolete storage facilities. So we've had a big focus on these in upstream thinking too. Um, however, it's important to remember that the risk of pollution, uh, while it can be reduced, that will never be to zero. Um, um, but we can achieve significant reductions by increasing the adoption of good or indeed best practices for each of these three processes uh, in integrated pest management. And again, I recommend that this is covered in a lot more detail in the UST Pesticide Simulator presentation. So what does that look like on the, on the ground uh, in upstream thinking too? Well, um, in terms of the second risk, mitigating the risk of spills during preparation and equipment washing, uh, what we would think of as point sources of pesticide pollution, we've been providing best practice advice to farmers and spray contractors on their methods, preparation and wash down, for example, of equipment. Um, and that's been delivered through a whole series of training, workshops and integrated pest management planning and advice sessions. Um, you can see some of those depicted here. And also we've been able to offer some capital investments um, to uh, provide assets or tools um, to help mitigate these and other point sources. For example, the creation of bio beds or uh, other, other, other bits of equipment. Another technique that we've used has very successfully in upstream thinking too has been the pesticide amnesty. Um, so this is mitigating the risk of loss during storage by offering uh, farmers the ability to um, have us dispose of pesticides um, safely uh, and uh, at no cost to themselves. Um, the uptake of this has been huge and to date in upstream thinking too, five tonnes of pesticide have been removed from farms in the southwest. Um, and that is a significant amount and just to put it in context that is enough pesticide to pollute over 23 trillion litres of water to the drinking water standard of 100 nanograms per litre it quite, a volume of water that equates to about 683 Roadford reservoirs um, or 3.3 times the size of Loch Ness um, so that's been hugely successful uh, and actually the pesticide amnesty has been written up as a report um, a case study which you can also uh, have a look at um, in your own time if you're interested in that work. So bringing it all together from a West Country Rivers Trust perspective, uh, we've now audited all of the advice and investments we've given in Upstream Thinking 1 and 2, and, and that's a total of 549 farms which have been given integrated catchment management, land management advice, um, and a total investment in Upstream Thinking 1 of 4.3 million and UST 2 um, somewhere over 3.4 million once all of the paperwork is finalised at the conclusion of the project. Um, and we've begun to do some more detailed analysis looking at um, the kinds of benefits that we might have uh, expect to see in our catchments as a result of the advice and investments that have been provided. Uh, and that work is ongoing, We're absolutely critical to the proof of concept work that, um, that we understand exactly what's been done and and why and what we hope to have achieved through those uh, the delivery of those actions. Okay, so that's the end of this third webinar in the series, which has focused on our proof of concept work examining the delivery of catchment management interventions. Um, this work has included the monitoring and evaluation of scheme governance, investment mechanisms, 
and the development and delivery of our integrated catchment management interventions toolbox. I hope you found this presentation useful and please note that all the outputs I have summarised can be found via links in the supporting information provided alongside the presentation on the WRT Catchment Science video channel. Thanks for watching this Catchment, catchment Science webinar. Please do join me again for the next presentation in the series episode 4 in which I'll be examining the fourth and fifth stages of our proof of concept approach in more detail. So here's a reminder about the next webinar in the Catchment Science mini-series. This will focus on our approach to the monitoring and evaluation of catchment management, uh, including the assessment of secondary benefits generated. This approach allows us to undertake effective dissemination to showcase the environmental, economic, social and cultural value generated by the scheme. It also allows us to influence environmental strategic planning and policy development, both locally and nationally, and it is absolutely vital in facilitating the continuous improvement of the overall scheme.